Hey guys. Wow. How am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> you will see none of those movements in my talk. In fact, I'm going to stay as stationary as possible. <laughs> Although when I was a kid, I used to be a basketball player. Or I thought I was a basketball player. And, uh, you know, I could shoot. I had a decent shot. I could never dunk. I could uh, never dribble with my left hand, at least not well. But every day for about five years, I would go outside my backyard, and I would, and I would be in my backyard, and I would simultaneously be in Game 7 of the NBA Finals. I think a lot of kids would do that. And there would be five seconds on the clock every day, and I would make that, I would make that fadeaway jumper, and it would go in, and I would be the hero. And if it didn't go in, I would magically get five more seconds on the clock, and I would try again. <laughs> The point is, I was telling myself that story, that I was, make, I was in this position, I was acting it out, I was having that experience, and I was telling myself the story, if I ever were in that position, by God, I could do it. So I'm here to talk about storytelling, because I'm a firm believer that we are, on some level, the stories that we tell. But first, I want to talk about one of my favorite stories, Don Quixote. Um, I'm intrigued by Don Quixote, it's you know, pages and pages and pages and pages, ancient Spanish novel. I'm also intrigued by um, Alfonsina Storni, who is a uh, poetess from the early 20th century from Argentina. And the reason I find these two different forms of liter literature so interesting is because even though Don Quixote is so long and epic and a lot of her poetry is very concise, I get a lot of the same feelings and understandings about the world from experiencing each piece of, each piece of literature. So as I went on in my young professional career and in my academic life, I became increasingly intrigued in how different forms of media, like maybe The Matrix, popular culture, <laughs> mid-90s Britney Spears, how things that are really, really disparate, if you really step back and look at them, you can find connections. And I'm fascinated by finding those connections and forming a window that we, that we see the world. Because I think the more connections you form, it's like looking at the same object from different viewpoints. It's like you're in 3D space and you have a novel over here and a book over here and you experience the world through a novel and a book, a novel and whatever over here and you experience the world through those different viewpoints, through those different perceptions of someone else. It helps your understanding of where you fit in. And so I am fascinated in finding those connections and telling those kind of stories. Uh, one particular story, Lonnie Bunch, who is the director of the uh, soon to be open African American Museum of Culture and History, was asked about this piece of headgear. This is a piece of headgear that they're going to put in their exhibit in the 1960s, and it was worn by a man at the time whose name was Cassius Clay while he was training for a fight with this man. Sonny left and we all know how that ended, even though, of course, this is from the rematch and not the original fight. But he, he was asked if he was going to put this piece of headgear in the sports section or not. He said, no, 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 no. It represents much more than sport. It represents all of the turmoil and all, everything that Muhammad Ali went in past and present that was wrapped up, that was personified, that, that personified African American life at that time. All in that one piece of headgear. All those stories were being told in that one piece of headgear. And he would only say that it's the museum's job to tell those kinds of stories. Uh, he called them unvarnished versions of the truth. And he went on to say that, he must, that they're, they need to tell stories that are exceptional and even stories that are controversial. And so again, if you give me the conceit that on some form we are the stories that we tell, if you look at the stories that we're telling today, maybe that'll tell us something about who we are as people and who we are as a culture. So what kind of stories are we telling? Well, we've got all kinds of stuff, and we, you know, from traditional uh, books down to more interactive media. Uh, movies, 3D movies, and you have the real D cool 3D glasses versus the old school RGB glasses, but you know, we have all these different kinds of media, and they've kind of evolved. And when I made this, I didn't mean for it to imply that everything, everything started with books and is now kind of converging on games. But I thought that was an interesting subconscious decision I made in my visual, so I left it in there. You can interpret that as you will. Um, but if you pull back, in my opinion, everything came from the oral tradition, and everything's going who knows where. If you pull back even further, who knows where that came from, maybe a stone obelisk from space. Maybe not. But the point is, we know where we came from, sort of. We know where we're, we, we don't know for sure where we're going. A lot of people think it might be social media. 
I think of social media as more of an interstitial connective tissue that kind of binds our media universe together. Uh, but the point is it's changing. Our media landscape is changing, and it may be changing into something more sophisticated or more juvenile, but it's changing, and it's changing fast. And I don't know what you guys think when you think about avant-garde technology and media and everything, but when I think about new media and new technology, I think of Aristotle. <laughs> Believe it. Because Aristotle is cool. And if you look at what Aristotle does in classical teachings, he shows us how to connect the dots. And he shows us how to make meaning where maybe there wasn't meaning before. And the new technology that we have is, even, is empowering us even more to do these kind of things. And what's really exciting is we're, you guys all know this, we're seeing more and more the decentralization of the author and collective consciousness and collective creativity. And you can actually design and plan for that. And so, not to turn this into a lecture on logic and classical rhetoric, but you know, you've got your syllogism, two truth claims, and a conclusion. And your conclusion space. And you've got this big brother, the enthymeme, where you remove one of the premises and you, you imply them. And supposedly, the enthymeme was a much more persuasive tool than the syllogism because you're having the user or the audience actively participate and figure things out. Um, we can go into Berg, I don't really want to. Berg's a really cool guy, he talks about human perception. Some people see him as Satan incarnate. I think he's a really cool guy. <laughs> The moral of the story is, if you remove a premise and you have the potential, potential to have different conclusions. And so what happens in a knowledge void, where you, let's say you know nothing except for these two premises I'm giving you, what, what happens is, is if instead of a premise, you, you, you change things and you give somebody a premise and a book. Well, let's assume there's knowledge void, you can also read. Well, what is a book? A book is one of those windows we were talking about earlier. It's an interpretation of reality. And so you've got this truth claim, and you've got this a book, a set of, a set of nested enthymemes that somebody's trying to interpret. And you get some really interesting things happening in this cyan conclusion space. And so while you might have an original conclusion based on a simple uh, truth claim, it might change for somebody's interpretation of a book. And what's really, really interesting is you give them a book and you give them a game. Then look what? Then, and you give them a movie. Look at, look at our conclusion space now. We've got an RGB color wheel. It's brilliant. <laughs> and if, in the more windows that you're using, that you're viewing this world through, wherever it may be, a creative in, intellectual property, a nonprofit that you're trying to galvanize support for, the more windows that people are looking in, the more complex their interpretations are. And imagine, oh my god, what play, the, the noun, not the verb. Um, and a graphic. Now imagine if you add more and more and more windows into this transmedia context and you pull back and you've got everything connecting to everything because people will make these connections. That's what people do. That's what, and, and technology is allowing us to do that at a faster and faster rate. It gets nuts. You have arrows going in between spaces off the page. And what this is getting at, it's, it's getting us closer to our audience and our audience closer to us as designers. We're bridging that gap. And you can even if you have a passionate enough audience and if you're clever about it, you can even empower your audience to become more clever than you. And this is happening. I'm not making this up. Uh, Will Wright, I'm taking this from Will Wright, who designed The Sims and uh, Spore. He pointed out in his keynote at Seagraph last year that the uh, lost Wikipedia page has over 6,000 articles, 25,000 registered users, etc., etc. And he pointed out that those early adopters are becoming more and more prominent in the, in the, in the audience of lost and they actually were able to reverse engineer a map of the island based on information that, that they had taken from watching the television show. And he also pointed out that a minor, a mid-level character on Lost, at, this was last summer, this may be different now, had more words in their Lostpedia entry than Barack Obama had on his Wikipedia entry. That's how ferocious this fan base is, that's how energized they are. And that's just one example. Maybe you've heard of the movie Avatar. I don't know. They had a constructed language in Avatar for the Navi, and they only had, you know, I can't remember if it was a few hundred or a few thousand, but a handful of words, just enough to, to communicate what they needed to communicate for the film. But the fans have gone nuts, and they've got morphology, syntax, grammar. They, they're building this constructed language, and they're being entrepreneurial about it. They're selling t-shirts. I'm with stupid in a, in a fictional language. <laughs> And my favorite and possibly most mainstream example, if you're watching Colbert, I love you. Co Stephen Colbert, 
uh, had the green screen challenge, where he took himself in front of the green screen, acting goofy with what we could perceive to be a lightsaber. And he said, okay, fans, go nuts. Take this footage of me and make something cool. And he had a contest. And that galvanized, that's what really galvanized the Colbert Nation. And from that, you're like, oh, Kevin, that's fun and games. But from that, my God, look what he's been able to do. He sponsored uh, an American uh, speed skating team. He had a treadmill and a bridge. Well, he didn't get the bridge, but he had the treadmill named after him. He's raised money for education, and he started a fund to help the spill in the Gulf. And so in conclusion, um, I used to think until I was very, very old, not very old, that the world, that, that the world looked like this, and Antarctica was as big as the planet. And it wasn't until later that I realized how skewed the Mercator projection actually is. And I thought, how would our perception be different if we grew up looking at different kind of maps? How would we see the world? And so I think what a transmedia context does is it looks, lets us pull back and look into these different windows and make our own connections and see where we fit. And uh, I've never played professional basketball. I barely played, I didn't even play high school basketball, I played church ball. But I had in my lifetime, I had the chance to take two game-winning shots. One was for a championship, and I made them both. Thank you.